call. We welcome Buck Dharma. How are you, Buck? Good, Eddie. How are you? Do you prefer Donald or... Uh, depends on the situation. <laughs> Hold on a second. I'm get, getting... Uh, my microphone went out. Hold on, my uh, headphones went out. It's throwing me. Hold on one second. We hear you here. I just lost a channel in my headphones somehow. I must have pushed a button, but we'll get through it until we play a song. Um, how did you get that nickname? When did you become... You became Buck Dharma in the beginning. There's a story behind right. it, though, right? It was, it was previous to Blue Oyster Cult. It was in the Sopo and Interbelly days, and uh, we uh, we were casting about for uh, a stage names, so, pseudonyms, and I like mine, so I, I took it. You uh, you held on to it. Yes. <laughs> was it part of a bigger conceptual thing? Um, not formally, no. Just uh, like the sound of it. Okay, hold on a second, Katie. Before you turn knobs, since we're doing a live show, why don't you see if you can call the engineer for me? Oh uh, yeah, I know this is on the. Yeah, I just pushed a button, but it's all good. But if you can get an engineer, that would be great. Um, I'm sorry, I'm distracted here by this. This uh, my headphones being out. So, I was so, distracted too when she walked in. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be Eric Bloom uh, joining us as well. Good to see you, Eric. Hello. I mentioned before that uh, we interview. You, you guys probably don't remember this because you do a ton of interviews and stuff. But we met and I did an interview with you guys at Sturgis, probably around 2003, 2004. It was one of the first things I ever did for VH1 Classic at the I, Buffalo Chip. At the Buffalo Chip, yeah. I remember because uh, Eric put funny eyeballs. In your eyes, yes, as those, we did the interview, uh, those laser kind of eyeball things. Yeah. yeah, is that an ongoing thing with you? I keep them in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love the hat you're wearing as a lifelong Giant fan. Giants, love how, that. How about that ending yesterday? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Didn't he just feel like he was gonna, you know, I mean, he does that so many times. It's Eli time. He's gonna make the pass and get it done. It was awesome. It was awesome. Not. Uh, I was hoping the Jets could repeat in overtime, but it wasn't meant to be. Oh, you, you Jet and a John. I will watch them both. See, I root against the Jets. I, See, I root against the Yankees. I do, too. Yeah. You're a Met fan? I'm a Met fan. I, where have we been, man? I this is know. beautiful. Let's go. Let's go to but City no, I Field don't, right I, now. I, don't root, I can't root for the Jets. I, I don't like the coach. I don't like the fact that they tried to cover up our championship banners and all that. Well, I, I, I've i seen the, the dual hat, you know, the green hat with the blue hat. I've never seen that. It's, it's split down the middle. <laughs> really? But uh, I like them both. So um, uh, back to you. So so, the name, Buck Dharma. You started before you, and everybody in the band had the names, and you're the only one who held on to it. Uh, I don't know how far the other names went as far as the other guys. I think but, I think we were all. Yeah. You know, Sandy came up with this stuff. Sandy right. Roma. Right. And he thought Don should be Buck, and he gave other names to everybody. And he's the only one that wanted to. He liked the name, so he kept it. Yeah. Was it part of a bigger visual thing? Were there going to be visual things that went with the name back then? No, no. It was just. A, was it going to be like a kiss thing, yeah. or a, like you were going to be dressed up as something to to with the alter ego name? Not really, but you know, it's Buck Dharma. You know, it's it's had a Western vibe and it had a uh, you know like a Eastern vibe. I had like a space vibe always yeah. to me as a kid. I always thought like you know I don't know that you had like a laser gun or something. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, the first name Buck is, you know, Buck Rogers, yeah. Buck Owens. Yeah. <laughs> did, did, um, uh, back, then, do you prefer being called Don or Buck? I, I know he asked you that, but do, what, um, what, whatever you want. It doesn't bother you. Yeah. yeah. Either way. Yeah. Hey, you I answer to both, and, you know, I have a Buck <laughs> hat and a Don hat. You know? There you go. All yeah. right. Well, Blue Oyster Cult's uh, members are here because this is really a momentous occasion that's being celebrated with this tremendous box set called the Columbia Albums Collection from Blue Oyster Cult, which is coming out in a couple of weeks. The date again? November 6th. November 6th. And is this all of your records? or, or All the Columbia records. So this starts in, what, 72? 72 to, what, uh, to, the, to, to Imagine Us and Beyond. With the album that we just heard. Which that's is the, the first, first album. That's the first album, yeah. right. When you, when you heard that, you're making some comment about the sound of it. What are your well, thoughts yeah, we about made that, that first album? Actually, I walked past the studio. We made that record in today on, on uh, 48th Street. Really? Yeah. And David Lucas, who's a good friend of ours, um, it's a long story, but he saw us jamming somewhere, asked mm -hmm. if we had a record deal, and uh, he said, I have a studio, and we did some early demos there, and we made our first album there. Yeah, I think uh, Wycliffe Sean bought that studio. When you go back and you listen to that to that record, Good memories. Can you take us back to that time? I mean, was what was the experience like going into a studio in New York? You're obviously a New York band. 
making a record for for the label. I mean, uh, when you go back and listen to it today, yeah. what 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 are your recollections of it? Did you realize what you were doing was was special? David Lucas had one of the first uh, Scully eight tracks in New York, so most most of these were four track at that time. So my ears just went away. Are you the doc? No. How about now? I totally. I just lost you, Don, and I lost myself. Yeah, I just lost myself. I'm sorry, guys. This is throwing yeah. everybody here. Hold anyway, on a yeah. David had a jingle studio with his partner, Tom McFall, and they they had one of the first Scully eight track machines. So that was a big thrill for us to really, you know, have that many tracks to work with. We've done demos in the for various uh, New York record companies, Mercury, uh, Columbia, and uh, I don't know uh, who else, but uh, Electra. Yeah. When we got into that studio, though, we we really sort of you know were allowed to do what we wanted to do, which was you know very cool. Which is kind of rare yeah. in the record business, especially back then. I mean, yeah, there was a lot was of very structured in those days. Although you know, right around that time was the, was the San the San Francisco bands had sort of exploded. You know, the uh, the and um, the the old concept of A and R was changing very rapidly at that time. You know, artists were writing their own material. You know, the record companies didn't have that much to do with it. And, uh, you know, the, our first record was a master purchase in that uh, Columbia bought the master, you know, and so they, after that, we had to record in Columbia studio because they had labor agreements at that time, so. So when you made the first Blue Oyster Cult album, it was, it was not done for Columbia. You did it originally as an outside production. We did it knowing that we were going to, the re record was going to come out on Columbia, but uh, we hadn't inked our deal previous to the recording existing. Because it's interesting because that's kind of the way records are today now. That's a kind of come full circle where people are making their records on their own and then licensing them to a label uh, because uh, the record industry has changed so right. dramatically. Yeah, and there's no production budgets anymore, obviously. Yeah, yeah. lots change. Well, listen, we're going to get this headphone situation sorted out and see what the heck button I pushed that did that. Um, and while we're doing that, probably be a good opportunity to play uh, a BOC song and then we'll come back and we'll probably have this sorted out. We'll also uh, have a discuss if you guys want to take some phone calls from your audience, the we number can. Huh? We can. 866-315-2663 if you'd like to give a call talk to Eric and Buck of Blue Oyster Cult who are here in the studio celebrating 40 years of BOC. As I said there is a, uh, a box set coming out which we'll talk more in depth about and we'll have you let you guys call in and talk to them as well. How about we do um... We should probably do one of the signature tracks, Godzilla, and talk a little bit about that when we come back as well. So Blue Oyster Cult hanging out. It's Eddie Trunk. We are live on Sirius XM 39, Trunk Nation, 866-315-2663 if you want to jump on with the guys. All right, there's Blue Oyster Cult and Godzilla. It's Eddie Trunk live with Eric and Buck from BOC in the studio. And uh, we are talking about the band and their amazing history of 40 years that started way back in 1972, being celebrated by a box set coming out called the Columbia Albums Collection. Uh, which documents and covers a lot of these albums. Now, your records were reissued in deluxe editions, if I'm not mistaken, and remastered not too long ago. It's not all of them. Okay, so this is yeah. is this a new new remaster, or is this those and others? Those and others. And there's bonus tracks now, and I understand there's a download card in here as well. Tell me yes, about that. Yes, the download card has um, four radio concerts that... Um, here they are, you know, on a disc or uh, on a download. And the origins of these concerts that were never released? I mean, what's the backstory? Well, they were radio concerts that? at the time, but here they are all, all together. Right, but you never put them out before officially yourselves. No. Right. There might have been bootlegs of it, but uh, here's the official. And the years they span, 70s, 80s? Steve, you can pull up in the in the, eight, in the eight, in, in the eighties. In the eighties. This happens more often than not that we have a representative manager agent of some sort in the studio with a band, and they they're no. We just happened earlier with Michael Schenker here, no doubt calling in the information. Do you, do you guys not? Do you guys remember much about your career? Are you always looking forward as to whatever was what. Or well, the highlights we remember, that's for sure. And those were what would be your your top three of well, for each I, of you? You know, one of the, the the first ones was we auditioned for Clive Davis, who's sort of a legend in our industry, sure. yeah. at the Black Rock Building, not very far from here, we 52nd Street and Six, mm -hmm. and um, we did an audition in a in a conference room. And is that what led to? Did he sign you? Did that lead he to your signed us, Yeah, yeah. Uh, we did an audition. We played five songs in a conference room, and he brought and along Harry Nilsson. Harry Nilsson was there. Patty Smith. 
uh, uh, Bobby Columbia, who was a blood, sweat, and tears, uh -huh. and a few A&R guys, and we we were against one of the short walls, and they were against the other short wall facing us, and we did five tunes. Amazing. What was the scene like in New York back then for you guys coming up? Boy, uh, how how much time do we have? A lot. Yeah. We got we got a half hour. <laughs> that was a transitional time, no doubt, you know, for music. Well, you know, the 70s were just starting, you know, but we've been bouncing around a little bit. We had an electric deal before this, two years before. and uh, we, Under the name Soft White Underbelly? Soft White Underbelly, right. and then Stalk Forest Group. That was the name after, between yes. that and BOC? S-T-A-L-K Forest. And did those records come out? It came out years later. Uh, right. The Rhino did a uh, Stalk Forest record. Yeah, Rhino, five but years ago. they found yeah. the Masters and yeah. finally put it out. Yeah, we thought the, they'd lost the Masters because Warner's went through about three management changes, so we didn't even know those tapes. Still I think existed. that's still uh, available somewhere if you add a print. Oh. <laughs> That'll be on the next right. repackage. <laughs> that's right. the next special edition. Bit torn only. Right. <laughs> to me, one of the neatest things on this package here of 17 discs uh -huh. is... Um, uh, the rarities, you know, some really interesting stuff that just happened to be recorded, you know, uh, at the time that uh, were found and polished up and, and uh, never been out there before. Yeah, historically, we didn't do a lot of extra recording like, like some artists do. You know, there's not like reams of stuff just laying around, so the, the stuff that hasn't been heard is pretty rare. So what made it, What you, you pretty much went into the studio with the intent of recording what was needed and there wasn't a lot of extra stuff and, and you didn't go in and do 15 songs, only put 10 on a record, you did right. 10 or 11. The philosophy was we didn't own the recordings anyway, so you know, why give the record company extra stuff? Right. We did always have a song or two extra that didn't make the cut. And a lot of them are now on here, but they've been already added before this package. Right. 40 years. Does it feel that way? Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> that would be Buck that said yes, like 50. and Eric that said no, and Eric said 50. <laughs> uh, but, but I mean, you know, you guys have been doing this, you know, as, as we said, for 40 years. There are bands that are hanging in there uh, for that long or longer, a few. Many of the bands that get to that point, you start hearing the retirement and farewell words coming from their mouth. How do you guys feel about that? Do you, do you feel you still have a lot of life left in this? Do you like the road? Do you want to keep working it? Personally, I, I love to play. You know, playing's great. That's what we do. Yeah. The rest of it's, you know, kind of a chore. The, the traveling is not so hot. Yeah. Did you like it when you were younger? Oh, yeah. Sure. Is it is it just that it's it's you're older and things are tamer out there? As no, far it was as... new. You know, it was a new experience. You know? Right. When we first started, we weren't flying. You know, we would, we, we would go out to Huntington and get a 12-foot box and a Fury 3, and, and that's how we would hit the road, in a, in a Hertz uh, Fury uh, four-door and a 12-foot box uh, rider truck. And uh, we had, like, one guy on our crew, and we would drive the truck ourselves. Yeah. Uh, it, it, when you start out, it's high adventure, no doubt. Right, right. And, you know, back in 72, when you first come on the scene, and again, you had predated, you know, the release of the first record, obviously, with these other bands you mentioned and other stuff that you had done. What were the things that you guys were listening to uh, that that kind of helped? I, mean, I know that your your manager, producer, Sandy, had a huge role in Blue Oyster Cult. But for you guys as musicians and players, what was the vision for the band at the very beginning 40 years ago? What were you... What were you setting out to do? Because, you know, BOC seems to walk a lot of lines uh, for a lot of different people. Uh, me being a guy whose history is predominantly in hard rock and heavy metal, I mean, you guys have a, you know, there's certainly a, a, an influence and an impact there. Metallica's covered your music and stuff like that. What, what, were, what was your vision of what Blue Oyster Cult was back then? Did you have a, you know, a niche you were looking for? No, it's our, our tastes are very, you know, eclectic, very varied. You know, we, uh, we're New York guys. We grew up with New York pop music, you know. I, I started out when I was a little kid. I had a, I had a crystal radio. I would listen to doo-wop on, you know, in my sleep, you know. So, uh, the the beginnings are, you know, uh, the the English blues uh, uh, artists, you know, the 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 Creams and the and the uh, Jimi Hendrix and Jeff Beck, Jeff Beck, and uh, Deep Purple. As you guys came into, I always find it interesting as bands that had their history and their roots in the 70s merged into the 80s. The 80s were 
a rough, rough time for most of those bands. They had a hard time making the adjustment with the musical changes. They had a tough time with the start of MTV, mm -hmm. all of a sudden having to make videos and being seen and the visual part of it. You guys navigated that maybe more successfully than most bands from the 70s, I think. You actually had a great deal of success, especially in the early 80s. Talk about that transition. Yeah, we carried it through. I, you know, I think video killed Southern rock, you know, pretty much, you know, and, and a lot of the, that genre, and uh, a lot of the dance music. Di you know, disco was the same thing, you know, it, you, you'd follow the charts and you'd see you get yourself getting pushed off by, by disco songs, and there's really nothing you could do about it. It was just fashion. You know? But uh, Burning For You was a, a big video on MTV in its early days. Right, that's what I'm saying. I mean, yeah. you, you guys had that sort of success. Did you like you know, Eric, as, as you know, one of the front men of the band, did you like the video? Did you like doing videos? Uh, the actual doing of it? Yeah, it was fun. But like anybody who, you know, goes to a movie set, you know, there's a lot of sitting around or whatever. And we we made the Joan Crawford and the Burning For You video in, in 24 straight hours. So it was pretty insane. Wow. Yeah. Joan Crawford, one of my all-time favorite voice to cult songs. Yeah, it's a, it's a right. little different. Joan Crawford has yeah. risen from the grave. That video was deemed too risque for uh, Yeah, it was banned MTV. from MTV. I yeah. don't know if I ever saw the video. Yeah. Well, the thing, you know, the thing is, by today's standards, it's... Uh, yeah, it's completely it's tame. tame. Yeah. But I think somebody somebody on the video touched a girl wearing a high school uh, Catholic girl outfit. Right. It was Steve? Yeah, yeah it was Steve. <laughs> it was Steve. <laughs> it was cast in the room. Steve, you got to pull up a microphone right. and tell that story, man. And he was a natural. <laughs> Steve, you are the, the manager of Bloister Cult, and you were the ones that, that caused all the controversy in that song by touching someone? Actually, the the director, of course, uh, it was all his idea, but yeah. Where was the idea for a song called Joan Crawford Has Risen from the Grave come from? It goes back to the late David Roeder, right. who, who, went, yeah. who went to uh, Stony Brook with Perlman and Meltzer and all the other uh, Brain Trust. And, and it, was, uh, his it was his idea, yeah. yeah. And David was an artist in his own right. He was sort of like a Shel Silverstein kind of a character, you know. And uh, he, he wrote songs, and, and Joan was, was one of them. Let's play that right now. This is, uh, as we go into the 80s here, uh, an album of great success for Bloister Cult. It was the first album that I think I got from you guys. Uh, you know, I was in high school at the time, and I remember getting it. I remember immediately gravitating towards this song for... For whatever reason, the, the, the spookiness of it, the, I didn't even know what you know, what it was about, but someone's rising from a grave, it's got to be cool, you know? Well, it, it, I think you got yeah. the idea from the book that had just come out about uh, that Christina had had written, his, her daughter. Uh -huh. And there's a haunting Oh yeah, the, you know, of the, Christina the, the whole premise those. of the tone is that, is that Joan... You know, Joan's going to come back and take Christina's ass. ...rises the grave to, to <laughs> avenge uh, you know, her, her dissing by her daughter in that book. This is from the Blue Oyster Cult album, Fire of Unknown Origin. Again, the uh, the collection, and I yeah, I just took this disc out searching for it. I've got, I mean, this is really a monstrous collection of music in here, all done in mini LP sleeves, which is really cool. The Columbia Albums Collection, all the albums plus some ton of extras from Blue Oyster Cult is out. The first, was it the first Tuesday in November, it sounds like, right? So you can get that uh, in yeah. stores then it's and also day online. That's what it is. Is it election yes. day? Well, you go vote. It's November 6th. Go vote so and then you go vote, buy the Oyster Cult. So let me ask you a question, Eddie. Who do you think would enjoy it more, Obama or Romney? This song or the box set? No, the box set. <sighs> Obama has is on the record as, as being a BOC fan. Is he really? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, he's uh, When Obama was in the Choom Gang back in uh, in Hawaii, they used to listen to the Oyster Cult. What gang? The Chum Gang, they called it. I didn't even know. How do you yeah. know this? There's a there's a biography out about Obama now, and I, I'm I'm struggling to remember the name of it. Is it a movie or is it a, is no, it a book? No, it's a uh, it's a book, and uh, it, and it's one of the guys who hang out, who hung out with that crowd at that time, and he wrote a book about it. And uh, yeah, they used to go up to the uh, pump station there in uh, in Oahu, and they would get a boombox, and then have Blue Oyster Cult and Aerosmith and Stevie Wonder. And they, really? They'd have. You know, like Heineken beers and, and Chum. And Chum is, you know, the, the, the reefer, you know. That <laughs> Chum is what? That's reefer in yeah. Hawaii? That's what, that's or what anywhere. they called it. That's it. That was their word for it, you know. And, um, yeah, and BOC played a prominent role. It's been mentioned a couple of times in the press.
Wow. Well, Buck, you just answered the question. I mean, unless Romney was partying to some BOC, I think oh, that this would be so. something the president I would want. Uh, I think Lawrence Welk was I, over at his house. Romney's probably tuned into BOC. I could be wrong, but I think it's probably a safe bet. Well, Romney's older, so he may, but then again, you know, yeah. you never know. Well, we're old. <laughs> Speak for yourself. We're all old, pal. We're all old. We're all, if we're all older, we're all getting there. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Blue Oyster Cult live show over the years. I also want to talk about what you're doing now and the current lineup of the band. We'll get into all that. As we continue with Eric and Buck of Blue Oyster Cult hanging out in the studio, it's Eddie Trunk. We are live on Sirius XM 39. I'll see if I can work on these... Uh, these, this headphone issue while the song is playing. And if we can, we'll try to grab some phone calls, too, before we let you guys get out of here. Um, this is Joan Crawford has risen. Let's well, just call it Joan Crawford, but the chorus, as you'll hear, if you never heard the song, is Joan Crawford has risen from the grave, Blue Oyster Cult, Fire of Unknown, Unknown Origin. This is 81? Yes, 81, right? 81. Check it out. It's uh, one of the many albums in the new box set collection as well. There it is, Joan Crawford from Blue Oyster Cult's Fire of Unknown Origin album, and I'm being joined in the studio by Eric and Buck of Blue Oyster Cult. My apologies to you guys about uh, waiting on the phone to take calls. Something went down with our board. An engineer came in, didn't really know how to fix it, left, and we are uh, without headphones, which makes it hard to take phone calls. So I apologize on that, uh, but we have a few more minutes left with the guys as we continue talking about the band and their 40-year history. Uh, and... Uh, this box set that came out, which I just played that track from, it is called the Columbia Albums Collection, and it sounds like Blue Oyster Cult is voting for Obama since he is an Obama. Oh, yeah, he's not. <laughs> no, no, no. But <laughs> you're not, but you're pretty appreciate that. I'm he's still a fan. flattered that he was in the BOC in his in his uh, Hawaii days. Yeah. That's yeah. Great. Well, I'm sure. Yeah, before he came from Kenya. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Uh, we are. Uh, celebrating this 40th anniversary with a big show here in New York at the uh, Best Buy Theater coming up very soon. Next Sunday. Next Sunday. Are you doing a full tour or is this just uh, one commemorative special show? Uh, it's a one special show um, and we're doing an acoustic night the night before in Port Washington on Long Island, mm -hmm. uh, the 27-28. It's the 40th anniversary weekend. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's in store for the uh, the big 40th show in New York? Being uh, we hope to have gig. a few guests, and then we'll also um, try to play some songs people might not expect us to play. Yeah, it's kind of a secret. We don't want to give away what we're going to do. But you came here from rehearsal, I know. Yes. Right. So uh, that might, not to say that you don't rehearse normally, but that might lend itself to the belief that you're working on some stuff that, you know, maybe some tracks you haven't played in a long time, things like that. Things like yeah. that. Yeah. The tracks you've yeah. never played. Tracks you've never played. <laughs> Playing something backwards. You know. <laughs> That'll really yeah. get tricky. Yeah. <laughs> no question. Um, tell me about the many people that have been in and out of Blue Oyster Cult over the years. I know just up until recently you had Rudy Sarzo playing in your band. Yeah, yes, we did. Rudy. Uh, tell us, uh, uh, all these guys that have been in, uh, has, it, has it been good to have you know, all these different people in and out of the band? Has it, has it been good for you guys to keep it fresh and interesting and exciting? Oh, yeah. We really dug playing with Rudy. You know, it's, uh, he's, he really added another uh, you know, element to the band. And uh, Plus, his ass looks great on stage. Yeah, he's <laughs> such a good-looking guy. And a, a sweetheart, one of the nicest guys in his business. But, he, did uh, he lick the bass at all? He has that signature yeah, lick the bass Yeah, he does, he does his hand thing, right, in between, yeah. in between notes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, how come he left the band? Well, he's got a lot of outside commitments, you know, and, and it just the scheduling just didn't work out anymore, so. He's in, like, yeah. 75 bands. Yeah, well, he, you know, he, his schedule didn't mesh with yeah. ours. And he, yeah, said, he does a lot of rock and roll fantasy camps, and I guess he's he's now playing with... Uh, uh, he's in the Queensryche thing, but I, in, I don't think it's at this moment. Yeah, but it's, yeah, it's coming up. He's in a lot of things. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. yeah, no, he's a great guy. And, yeah. and, and, uh, I, no, no, shout out to Rudy if he's listening. Yeah, for sure. And I'm sorry Hola. I didn't get a Como chance to see him, yeah. see him play with you guys because that would have been pretty cool, but I never caught one of well, those Well, we have Passam Sultan now. so Yeah, I was going to yeah. ask you about that. So yeah. so tell me about Just the lineup as, now. as big a heavyweight as, yeah. as uh, Rudy. Yeah, uh, with, with Kaz, we got a whole new chapter in uh, BLC's history, and uh, he's, he's adding a, a really good vibe to the band. And the rest of the band is? Uh, Jules Rodino on drums. He's been our drummer the last decade. Mm -hmm. And Richie Rich Castellano, Castellano has been uh, doubling on keys and guitar for about 
the yeah. last eight or nine years. He's been with us a long time too. So outside of the base position, you've been pretty, pretty. Uh, yeah, it's been pretty much the stable. same. Yeah, it's. I would call it evolutionary. You know, it's just, just you know things change and they continue at the same time. And how active are you guys now? Because we talked about this being the 40th anniversary of the band, and you talked about your how much you like or don't like being on the road, the parts of it you like and don't like. But how active are you still touring? I mean, do you are you doing basically weekend gigs? Or are you going to go out there and you're going to actually you know hit the road and do a full full on tour? Because more and more bands that I talk to seem to be going the route where they're flying in for a weekend and knocking out two, three shows and that's, coming that's back. That's about what we do. Yeah. Uh, we work mostly uh, like April to October with a sprinkling of other dates in, in between. Yeah, we, we like to go back and forth because we like to have a home life too. And We do about 80 shows a year. We'll hit the road if we go overseas. Obviously, we'll be over there for a while or, for, or sometimes we go to the West Coast and stay there a while, but uh, we don't go out like we used to you know, for months at a time. Yeah, we used to do 200 plus shows a year. We, that, that, those days are gone. Right. You meant, do you still have a big following overseas? Do you get over to Europe a lot? We do, we do good. We yeah. just did uh, three of the big festivals this summer in Europe. It was great. Eric and Buck of Bloister Cult are my guests. We are live here on Sirius XM 39, Eddie Trunk Live. Um, one of the most legendary things for those uh, people that saw it and remember it is the, the Black and Blue tour. Yes. Uh, with Black Sabbath, which was their first album with Dio, which is one of my all-time favorites. They were on the Heaven and Hell tour. It That's was 80, record. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and you guys uh, out there touring together. Yes. Did you both have fond mm -hmm. memories of that tour? Were you happy about it? It was Did a great you... tour. I don't know how happy they they were with it, but you know, we, we thought it was fun. Yeah, wow. there, was, there was a little controversy at the time uh, um, because of who closed the show kind of thing, and it was really up to the promoters and we didn't have any say in it, and they thought they should have closed every night. So it was one of those, you know, missing matches. What was it though? Was it a flip? Did you flip flop, or did you guys close yeah, every no, night? No, yeah, no, it's fifty fifty. Yeah, whatever, whatever markets we were big in, we'd close, and then they would do the same. Mm -hmm. Now that film, wh where does that stand? Does that feel? Because that's what one of these things people are always trying to get and looking for, and saying, "Man, it we were to told have... that uh, Tommy uh, Tony Iommi doesn't want it released." Really? Yeah. But uh, that could be apocryphal. I, I don't know. But that's what filtered down to us. Who owns the film? Do, do you guys jointly own it? Steve? I'm telling you, Steve, you got to pull up a microphone. They're, they're managers over here answering all the questions. Well, right. Steve and Sandy well, managed Black yeah. Sabbath at the time. Oh, you did? Yes. So, you, Steve, you have the film? Like, are you, you physically have it? The original, the original master is video. The original master is video. And and so, but it, it's I mean it's ripe for being cleaned up and remixed and put out as some sort of it's not it's not under our control. So, but they so you and you and they pull, can you come to the microphone for one second, Steve, please. Yeah. He's Where's making Steve? hand motions over there to me. <laughs> so you you and so you meaning the Bloister Cult Camp and the Sabbath Camp own it jointly. Um, in point of fact, you know, Sandy. And there was a, there was a royalty deal for the big, for the big. Basically, it was supposed to be split in thirds. We produced the film. So you produced the film. So you can't put it out without everybody's we approval. Were, we were exactly. Or you just don't want to do it because you're being a good guy. We, no. We need everybody's approval. We don't have everybody. So Tony Iommi is the holdup, and I'm going to be seeing Tony in about a week, and I'm going to talk to him about oh, it. Oh, uh, say hi for us. And I'm going to say hi, I and I'm going to say let's get black and blue out. Well. I hope he's well. Yeah, most importantly, his his health. You yeah. know, obviously, he's been uh, he's been struggling a little bit. One of my favorite guitar players. Yeah. So you yeah, have, we, we were huge Black Sabbath. Fans yeah. Going in. So. What were your thoughts as big Sabbath fans when that happened? Uh, that tour happened, and Ronnie had just come into the band. Well, I kn I know Ronnie for twenty years before that. Mm -hmm. So right. uh, yeah, we were yeah. really happy to do it. You know, we we thought it was a you know a great opportunity for us, frankly. I, I understand you're a big uh, Ronnie fan. Oh, so, he was yeah. a dear friend, and I'm a huge fan, and I loved his um, I loved his his era of Black Sabbath. His period of Black Sabbath is what. How I was first exposed to Black Sabbath because I'm 48. In 1980, I was 15, uh, around 15, and that was the first album I ever got from Sabbath was Heaven and Hell. There you go. So yeah. I was a huge fan of that period. And of course, I went back and got into the other stuff as well and loved that. But that that particular period was uh, 
special to me, and since Ronnie's become a, a Ronnie had become a really good friend over the decades. Well, I I used to go see Ronnie play at fraternity parties when he was in Ronnie Dio and the Prophets. Really? Yeah. So I'd go way back with him. That would be in Cortland. Uh, well, all over upstate New York. Upstate. Right. He's from Cortland, but right. I went to college in Geneva, New York, and I saw uh, the Prophets. I saw Elf. I saw the Electric Elves. I saw every permutation of his career as a college kid. So you must have been really surprised when he, from that, became this metal icon. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because okay. that was anything but. He was always great right. in, in every in every iteration. Yeah. He was yeah, great. It was great to see him, you know, break out of the uh, the club scene, you know, and, and do so. Yeah, no doubt. Who else did you guys kind of see on that scene back then? Who were the guys that were you were seeing while you were on in New York, and you know that that. that went on to bigger things or maybe should have gone on to bigger things. Well, that would be Wilmer and the Dukes, but that's that's a whole other story. <laughs> Wilmer, and the, Wilmer Dukes, and the Dukes yeah. was an R&B band from upstate New York that played fraternity parties, uh, you know, dances, parties, etc. Yeah. So, um, yeah, they were huge in upstate and all over New England. A lot of Long Island New York guys and girls went to college in upstate New York, and upstate New York, it was this, this circuit of, of colleges and, and uh, clubs, and there were there were five or six really amazing copy bands. You know, there were show bands basically. You know? And they and the level of, of detail and musicianship was was astonishing to me. You know, to go upstate and see this 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 quality. And Ronnie's band was one of those bands. And uh, you know, I think Ronnie's probably the biggest star to come out of that circuit. I'd say definitely. You know? But yeah. uh, not to say not to diminish the quality of in general of, of of club music you know and uh and fraternity party music in those days it was great do you guys each have a a blue oyster cult album that you would consider in other words somebody younger listening to this somebody that you know certainly may know blue oyster cult from burning for you or don't fear the reaper or or, or songs like that have, that have become so iconic but if you had to point somebody towards a Blue Oyster Cult album who's a beginner or who doesn't really know the history of the band and, and wasn't a fan at any point, is there an album in your catalog of these 40 years that you would kind of say, well, that would be a great place to start? Uh, Eric's pointing to I'd you, say Buck. i probably Secret Treaties is a good good record. To I would agree. That's our, our third also, album. Also, I think Cultosaurus, the first record we do with Martin Birch, is a very uh, unique record and I think uh, you know captures... Uh, the band at a, at a at a unique time in our history. You know, I, obviously the songs with the, the albums with the with the hits on them are what better known people. You know, they they might want to check out the album cuts if they don't know them. But uh, you know, as far as the band and and w what the band was and uh, uh, represented, you know, I think those records are particularly good. Martin Birch, a legendary producer, I imagine that must have been a big thrill for you. I know you said you were. Deep Purple fan too. Mm -hmm. uh, that must have been a big thrill for you to be able to work with him. Yeah, he, he was, was a pisser. He was great. Uh, a good guy. Yep, very forthcoming with uh, knowledge and stories and uh, you know his uh, how he did stuff. You know, because we were all sort of amateur engineers ourselves. You know, we just loved the whole process of working with him. He uh, he's retired now, right? Is he out of the as business? As far as I know, as I know yeah, from he is, yeah. producing. Him and Ted Templeman are the two guys that I, yeah. I think I've both kind of left that world a little bit that a lot of people ask me about. Yeah, well, of course he did really well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so he could do whatever he wants. I think some of those iconic producers got better deals on making the albums than the artists themselves did at times. I'm sure you're right. <laughs> or were wiser about what they did with the, the, the money that they got at the time from some of them also. Yeah. Uh, going forward now, 40 years in the, you know, in the books, mm -hmm. What's what lies ahead? Of Forty this? more. Forty more? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, we're not going to retire. I don't think. You know, I don't think we're going to say farewell, are we? I don't think so. If you did, would you eat? No one would believe it if you did a farewell tour anyway. Nobody believes farewell tours anymore. It's. It, well, I was trying to. I ask this question all the time. Has there ever been a band that's done a farewell tour and actually went away? I don't think How so. How many farewell tours does Kiss have? Kiss? Yeah. Well, they had one. But it was, it was still going. <laughs> it was 12 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, they've had one that just that doesn't yeah. end. But yeah. there's been bands that have come and said second farewell. No, this is really it. And yeah. then that, I guess you get it off. You can't refuse. It was about as close as, as it was. But they actually did get back together again. Who's that? Green. 
uh, yeah, many years later. They made, yeah. they made a farewell record, and then they broke up, and then that was it. Yeah, you know, yeah. 30 years later, I guess. Zeppelin said they were done after John Bonham died, but then they just, they did that 07 show for Ahmed Erdogan, which I saw that recently at the Ziegfeld, that premiere. Yeah. And, you know, that's, I guess they didn't do a farewell tour. Obviously, they ended for tragic reasons, but yeah. they really have not reconstituted the band at all. So no. you mentioned Kiss being a New York band yourself and mm -hmm. obviously predating them a little bit. You have some real early history with them. Well, right? their first show was opening for us. And then the legendary stories they tell it is a year or two later you opened for them, right? Uh, a few years later, yes, yeah. A few years later, but certainly, yes. And that's all Coliseum. Yeah. What were your thoughts when they opened for you guys? Because those guys have a certain way of writing history that uh, sometimes really favors the, the their their version of things. Uh, you know, that uh, clearly they became a much bigger band very quickly. But, yes. But when, when that first show, when they opened for you guys, were you, were, did you feel you I got... I thought they were great. Yeah. They also, were, you know, they did a few shows with us, and, and they show up, and they got a semi and, like, 12 guys on their crew, you know? <laughs> and we have the we box. We have the 12-foot <laughs> box. And, and the Plymouth Fury. Even know? at that point, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man, that's that's too much. Yeah, that, that that's a very that's a very big uh, st uh, story in KISS history that, that people yeah. talk about is that that first show, and then a couple years later, I guess it was Nassau yeah. Coliseum, where you guys were supporting them. Also, those guys are really tall, you know. They're Especially not small with the guys boots. to begin with, and then they got the, the six-inch boots, you know, so they, they loom. Yeah, they tower over us they, yeah. in many ways. For any uh, any other bands that you really, you know, bands you really enjoyed sharing tours with? or, or, oh, or Quite anything? a few. Yeah. Any great stories or any any personal favorites that you were like? It was great to play with Thin Lizzy. We always had a great time. They were very kind to us and nice, and we had a lot of fun hanging out. Uriah Heap. Yeah. Uriah Heap. Love of Uriah Heap. Yeah. Great. Mick Box. Great, great, great guys. Great band. Yeah. Oh, and uh, Nazareth. All Scottish bands, but Nazareth. And Nazareth. Great guys. Yeah. In, in the case of all three of those bands, three bands that really never really got their due in America. If you think about it, Thin Lizzy in America is known for a song or two. In in Europe, it's it was a totally different thing. They had 15 right. big hits or whatever. Uriah Heep, I don't think outside of maybe Easy Living or a couple things ever really broke through in a big way in America. Same with Nazareth, Love Hurts, and that's yeah. about it. So that's interesting that all three of those bands are you know great bands, but bands that never really crossed over. Great and bands and good guys had the had the huge breakthrough. Did you ever do any dates with UFO? Many, yes. yeah. Yep. Those are another yep. way is a band. good, good buddy yep. of ours. You still talk to Pete? Have you been well, in touch with him? We, you know, we run into bands here and there. We, yeah. we yeah. I don't think we worked with them in a while. No, we haven't crossed paths in a while. Pete Way, he's such a character. We're do, we're doing a tour together many years ago. We're on an airplane, and we're both both bands are on the same plane, commercial flight. And the stewardess comes on and says, "Will everyone please stand up and sing Happy Birthday, to Eric Bloom at 12 B." And Pete Way gets up and conducts everyone on the plane. <laughs> it wasn't my birthday. <laughs> and, you know. Then I get to the hotel at the Continental Hyatt House in L.A., and we're playing together. And, oh, Mr. Bloom, you have a telegram. Of course, this is three dates. Internet. Sure. And I get, oh, a telegram? What's this about? And I opened it up. Can't wait to come down and party with you, signed Susan George. And I go, what? <laughs> you know, and then I hear giggles behind me. It's Pete Way. Uh. Yeah, you know, so that's just the way he Ever is. Ever the jokester. Everybody's got a great Pete Way story, yeah. and uh, you know, I wish him well. He's been having some struggles lately. We had Michael Schenker in here just earlier tonight, and he tried to get him on the road with him recently, but Pete still hasn't kind of straightened up. He's still kind of, you know, still living in those hard partying years, and it's catching up yeah. to him real bad. So I think he had some immigration problems in America too. You, but but it. unfortunately, rooted off of the stuff we're talking about. <laughs> So, you know, I love the guy to death, and they're one of my all-time favorite bands, but um, he's had some struggles, and I hope he, I hope the light comes on for him and he can get it together soon, because none of us are getting any younger, and I'd love to see him playing those practical jokes and playing the bass, too, you know? It'd be great. Everybody's got a Pete story. Whenever you bring up Pete Way, they all have a, a look on their face, very similar to Eric's right now, <laughs> you know, just <laughs> shaking their head. He yeah. might have been the Keith Richards of hard rock, I think. Um, well, listen, guys, I appreciate a few minutes uh, you coming in, and uh, I'm sorry that we couldn't get this together to get your phone calls because the uh, headphones went out, something went haywire on our board, and I'm lucky, I guess, that we're still on the air. But the important thing is that Blue Oyster Cult playing, uh, it's this Sunday, right? Yes, uh, Saturday in Port Washington at the Landmark, 
and Sunday the 28th at the Best Buy Theater in Times Square. And Election Day, you can pick up the uh, Blue Oyster Cult, the Columbia Albums Collection box set. Uh, all the albums in very cool little vinyl replica sleeves. The download card for the rarities. Very, very cool booklet in here as well. Written by Lenny K. Written by Lenny K. And yes. you can uh, you can go maybe vote for Obama or Romney. That's what I hear the race is yeah. this year. And you can be one or the other. Although there's a lot of lot of people on the ballot in Florida. Can you know. still vote for Ross Perot? <laughs> Isn't he on it every time? No, he's not on it this year. <laughs> he's not on it? At least in my state. And people want information about the track listing and everything, it's at blueoystercult.com. Blueoystercult.com is the place to go as well. Well, guys, thank you so much. It was uh, a pleasure talking to you, and I'm glad that you came in. And uh, we'll do it again when we, get these when damn phones, we get these damn phones working and see what the heck's going on. I'm going to work did, on Did, you, did you look at the string between the two juice cans? You know, I think we'd be better off with that. If that was the case, I think that might actually be a little bit better. It, it, the technology gets bigger and bigger, but the problems seem to happen more frequently. You know, are you? The, the last thing I just thought of before you go, the whole, the whole vinyl thing, with vinyl somewhat making a comeback. Is this going to come out on vinyl? No. Steve says no. Sorry. Okay. That would be fun. Are I, you guys? I have a turntable. Are you? Do you guys still have turntables? Do you still like your vinyl? Yes. I have too many vinyl records not to have a turntable. Yeah, I have about 12 feet of vinyl records and a turntable, but... Uh, you still fire it up every once in a while? No. No, actually, I haven't... I haven't. I do. Since I last moved, I haven't, I haven't done it. Yeah, no, I don't either. I, I, I'm, I'm holding on to CDs. I hope CDs continue. That's what I'm fighting for. The vinyl thing, it's just... I get it. It's cool packaging. I'm sure from an audiophile standpoint, it sounds the best, but I still... I still like this box set. I yeah. still like CDs, things you can look at, flip through the booklet. It's compact. You can go and you can still rip it in your phone or your MP3 if you want. It's just, I don't know. I'm, I like the ultimate jukebox, so where you, where you could hear just any song you could possibly think of at any time. And it's right there. That, that's what I'd like. Yeah, well, the online yeah, the streaming it's stuff. It's like Spotify, only spot, if, if, if it had everything. And like Spotify doesn't have everything. Right. It's all in the cloud. <laughs> so they tell us. All right, man. Well, thank you guys for coming in. I, I appreciate it, and uh, we'll be on the lookout uh, for the next 40 years of Blue Oyster Cult. New studio music, maybe? You never know. Yeah, never say never. Maybe a little uh, you know, doing some writing, some thinking about that. We'll see. Yeah, this, this, this tune's in the, in the works. I nice wanted talking to, to you, Eddie. Nice talking to you guys, too. Thanks for coming in. Next time, Eric, bring the funny eyeballs. Okay. And, uh, we I enjoyed that. These are the funny eyeballs. <laughs> I do this from Revolution by Night. It's Take Me Away. One more from Blue Oh, one of my faves. Is it? Yeah. Very good. I wrote that with Aldo Nova. Aldo, that's right. Yeah. I forgot about Aldo. Aldo Nova's been like kind of out of the scene for a while. I think he's up yeah. in Canada and he's a having, a good, writer, having a good time. Also, yeah. I think he wrote some stuff for Celine Dion. He did. Probably writing stuff for people that sell a lot of records and yeah. sitting back and enjoying the checks and yeah. staying out of the spotlight. Probably on the chaise with the... Uh... <laughs> he played a few dates with who? Dates. Himself? In Canada? Yeah. Next week, we're going to have Steve from Blue Cult's <laughs> Management as our guest. And we're going to put him in. He's got all, he, he's, he's got all the info. He's got all the info. Yeah, I, I talked to him off. He's, he's tuned in. I talked to him off air about Billy Squire, who he, he works with. And we got to get Billy out there playing again. So we'll, we'll, do, an, we'll, do, we'll do an interview with Steve Schenck as my guest next week. Uh, Blue Oyster Cult, take me away as we uh, let these guys get out of here. Glenn Hughes joins us at the top of the hour. It's a busy show. It's Eddie Trunk live on Sirius XM 39. Night, folks.